Okay, so this is the first uh, in a series of four sessions on actions with a low risk of arrest. We no longer say that no actions are arrestable because in a way it depends, I guess, on the context in which you do them, uh, but also because there are, as you know, um, people in Christian climate action who uh, will do actions that involve civil disobedience and it's important that everybody knows that that is the context in which all the actions that we take are done, whether they themselves involve civil disobedience or not. So this se session is on telling your story. And the next one is on pilgrimages protest, and then we'll have one on vigils, and the fourth is on die-ins. And after that, we'll have a session on making the most of your actions uh, by using local press releases and, and social media. Um, let's begin this session maybe by praying together. So if you can just gather yourself and be present to each other in this session and to God. Creator God, we acknowledge our responsibilities to your world. May the Holy Spirit inspire us and fill us with your courage and your love as we step up into the power to make change that you are calling us to. Amen. So the first question that I want to start with is this. Is storytelling, in fact, part of our mission of direct action? And I come to it from a position that I believe very strongly that it is. And that's for two reasons. And the first is because I think our more direct actions need explanations. And so part of our role as storytellers is to explain both the overall context of what we do and explain uh, specific actions. And I don't really warm to military analogies, but if I say we really need to help people to make sense of our battles if we're to win the war. And the second is that I think we need to help people to step up, to step into their power of action. And storytelling does both these things. And everyone can tell a story. So it can be the first sort of step into becoming more of an activist. Everyone can tell stories that help to build relationships and empathy and stories that inspire people to act and to stay involved. And we need to, we need these stories really to generate empathy and support for our activism and stories that offer a sense of hope that inspires positive change. The stories of action and everyday courage. And I'm actually going to start, I think, with what we can learn from two recent academic papers. Uh, they were published in 2020 and 2021, so they really are quite recent. And I, I think it's because it's really important to be informed by what the research says before we launch into doing something. Uh, and there are other papers about this, but I've chosen uh, these two. Um, and partly the 2021 paper, because it's a, it, it kind of looks at a number of other uh, bits of research on this subject. So the point made by the 2020 paper feeds into this ongoing discussion about whether fear simply demotivates people. And, and studies have documented a, a widespread tendency to reject fear and guilt appeals as being manipulative and disempowering. So we have to bear that in mind. That's sort of the context that we work in. And that similarly sort of shame appears to trigger a defense mechanism in most people. And they then resort to sort of justifications and exonerating themselves from blame rather than reflecting and acting on the issues as we want them to. However, the reason I'm touching on this 2020 study is that it makes an important point. And what it says is that climate change conversations with pessimistic endings triggered an emotional arousal. And that influenced how listeners took on board climate change risks. So what it means is that hard-hitting stories are more likely to make 
people take climate change seriously. So we shouldn't be afraid of telling the truth about how bad it is. But what we need to look at is how we help people come out of that corner. And this is where the other bit of research comes in. So the authors of a 2021 paper that really helpfully was given to me by uh, Michael Kossu of, um, of, of um, Natural Born Storytellers, and some of you may have met him when we walked on the Camino. Um, and he's really experienced in storytelling. And he sent me this paper because the authors are asking, how do we transform the response to the stories we tell about climate change from issue to action? And so what they found is that in the media and in popular culture, the climate change narrative is primarily told as one of doom and disaster, uh, as a sort of existential threat to human society, the natural world, and even to the planet itself. So dire predictions, extreme consequences, and which it is. That's the message that grabs attention and that we want people to understand. And it seems from the research and their surveys that people are getting it. Their research uh, and the research of others shows that in the last couple of years, words like crisis and emergency and breakdown are used among large parts of the public to describe climate change. And opinion surveys in 2019 and 2020 have shown record levels of concern globally. And that's held up even through COVID. But what's worrying is that studies also show that people's willingness to actually take up pro-environmental behaviors is flatlining. And instead, feelings of powerlessness run high. So the researchers looked at how to turn the understanding that people have, that awareness and concern to action. And they found that the common view within climate communication is the idea that awareness of or concern about climate change is, or at least ought to be, the driver of climate positive behaviors. Whereas in reality, this doesn't seem to be happening. In fact, a number of recent studies in 2016 and 2020, a number in 2020 actually show that beliefs and concerns and worry and anxiety about climate change actually only weakly or moderately correlate with climate positive behaviors, whether that's consumer action or activism. So they then had a look at some of the research in psychology and they proposed that in real life, actions often come before beliefs. And that the conventional view that beliefs drive actions really only holds true when attitudes are strong and the available actions feel doable and meaningful. So that might be the case, for instance, for people within CCA. But when talking to kind of a wider general public, we need to bear in mind that the opposite, that is that actions actually drive beliefs, seems to be more useful when attitudes are weaker or when we face making difficult choices. And in these circumstances, an initial decision to take some action actually leads on to a strengthening of our attitudes and beliefs and feelings, and that this then leads on to deeper engagement. So what we might need to do with our storytelling is set people on that path. And we need to think about how we set people on the path of what is effectively self-persuasion. How do we make them take that initial step when they might feel a bit unsure? And again, it seems from research that the key is to let people know that there is the opportunity and that they have the capability to engage in action, which they can experience as meaningful. They need to know what they can do. And again, research seems to suggest that an important source of this agency is social learning. So that means that we discover our own agency 
as we learn from the actions and experiences of others. This is kind of related to a concept uh, called self-efficacy, the belief that each of us has in our own ability to act. And studies have shown, firstly, that efficacy beliefs, the belief in our own ability to act, is a strong predictor of public climate action. And that secondly, this self-belief that follows from taking on an easy action can result in people taking on harder actions. I mean, it's obvious really, but for many people, it's these concepts of agency and self-efficacy that are missing when it comes to communication about climate change. So taking all this on board, our storytelling might then want to say something shocking about the effects of climate change to engage the emotions, and then maybe focus on generating agency, showing people the opportunities by telling stories about how we act within a specific place or a specific context. And there's plenty of empirical evidence that stories about people taking action do succeed in creating agency in others. So having said all that as a sort of background, maybe let's look at some of the nuts and bolts. And that paper that I was referencing through that section, um, yeah, I'll send out the, the, the reference to that piece of research. I'll send you details of the paper, perhaps in our WhatsApp chat. But the paper makes another really good point. In fact, it's a point made by lots of climate communicators, actually, that good stories that are carried in our hearts are generally about people, not about issues or statistics. And for both the audience and the storyteller, it can be overwhelming to think about something as vast or issue-based or seemingly impersonal as global warming. And the antidote really seems to be telling stories about people. People made the climate crisis, people are impacted by it, people can act on it too. And the important thing for activist storytelling is that the story structure places people taking action at the heart of each story. And the other thing is that there are numerous intersections with social issues that when you tell a story, you can personalize with your audience in mind. Things like racial and economic justice, women and families being at the forefront of the effects of climate change, immigration and migration, national security and health. You need to connect the dots with the things that the people you are talking to already care about. So maybe moving on then. Uh, to some practical things about how to tell your story effectively. <laughs> the first and the probably the biggest piece of advice, I think, is not to worry about whether you think you're a good public speaker or not. This is actually just you telling your story. In a way, it's not public speaking. It's you in conversation. And the more you practice, the more confident you'll be about it. Go to the pub with friends. Invite them to a kitchen table session. And you may have to fake a bit of confidence at first because actually in a way engaging storytelling is one that kind of people think you're telling with a degree of confidence but it will get easier and for us as a, a as a christian community i think it's really important that we don't lose sight of the fact that the holy spirit's there holding our hand through this and a good story isn't complicated but it does need a scaffold. So there are a couple of things that you need to think when structuring your story. And the first is your purpose. Why are you telling this story to this audience at this time? And then try and construct your story for your audience. Maybe it's helpful to look at it from the audience point of view. What will they take away that's a value for them? And in, unless you know you've got a niche audience, don't use jargon and keep the language simple. Kind of maybe aim for your language at someone who's finishing primary school or starting secondary school and you'll know that you've kind of covered all your bases. I mean, that might 
not be appropriate for an audience if you're talking going into a school for instance and talking to a bunch of a-level students but if you're talking to the general public it, it's always good in your story to make sure that nobody feels left out or left behind by the language that you're using the second thing to think about is that you need to have a personal connection so the story should either involve you or someone you feel connected to so you can be authentic and if you're telling someone else's story and and there's no reason that you can't it's sometimes really powerfully motivating then make it part of your story now i sometimes tell a story about how i came to extinction rebellion after having my heart opened by a story about a villager in the peruvian andes but that's now part of my story and i tell it as as part of my story not just his story and then you might want to link your story to a larger meaning that informs and inspires so that's about what is the message that you are trying to give and towards the end you might want to amplify that message in your story and it's really important to hold on to the fact that a relatable story isn't complicated and and it although it needs a structure it's pretty basic it's a beginning a middle and an end and i know that sounds like primary school stuff but but it works okay so a beginning where you set the scene and this might be the time for that climate related shocker and really importantly its impact on you so it might be this thing about climate change or environmental destruction came into my life or became important for me and then you need a middle kind of i responded by doing this and i think vulnerability and action are the key things here you need to be relatable you know kind of like your audience and not some kind of superhero and then you need to say what you did your response as a kind of ordinary person like them and you can do that either by saying i'm just like you or more importantly giving details of what makes you like them and then you need an end an outcome that your audience can take on can join with or empathize with depending on what your purpose for your story is and an important piece of advice that i really think this is what i hold on to is to keep it focused now, wanting to tell your whole story is great but if you do there's a good chance that your audience will have zoned out by the time you get to the good part because the human brain actually has a pretty short attention span so it's kind of quite important to keep focused on what was the purpose of each part each detail you're including think about what you want to get across in your story include some details that support to that and then take out pretty much everything else um and that kind of works well to tell a story that zooms in maybe to look at a very small episode in 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 your life that models the why and how of doing something you know maybe i lay on the ground outside my local barclays and this is what's involved kind of story but it doesn't exclude doesn't mean it isn't good to tell stories that look at the bigger picture perhaps as a way of critiquing power dynamics or current framings but if you choose to do that you still need to keep it personal you might want to say something about current systems and things you know my dear friend is on trial for breaking the window of a bank yeah you know, i was deeply worried but i understood why she did it and then you know frame your story and you'll notice that in that i said you know i'm deeply worried one thing that human brains do is they pay attention to emotions so your emotional state is a detail really worth having in there because effective stories don't just share what happened and when they also tell how you felt what motivated you what drove you to continue how you felt at the end and that is what connects you with your audience so kind of in conclusion 
and before I ask you to do some of your own work. Most people think of the world through images and experiences rather than stats and information. That's what stays with you. And if we want to get people to take action on climate change, we can't just talk about the threat. We also have to tell stories about the ways in which their actions can make a difference. 